Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I need to switch slide. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here to present this work because it's, it's work I've been working on like for like, already a few years, and I've finally managed to get something that I'm quite proud of. And in fact, I think it has opens a lot of possibility to reason on impure high-order programs. So yeah, I would like to talk about that now. So what I'm going to, to present here is this work about how to reason about contextual equivalence of programs written like in a language with references. And so first, what is contextual equivalence? So there's a standard way to present it, but I'm not going to choose this one. I'm going to choose like a different presentation, maybe that will talk to more people, which is, in a way, we take a signature, so a list of functions and wizard types, like an uh, API, and then we've got two modules that, that are going to implement this signature. And the question of contextual equivalence is to decide, is there a program that can distinguish those two implementations, those two modules? And what does it mean to distinguish the two modules? It means that ca can we observe a, a distinction, a difference uh, of the two programs? And we want to be able to do that while respecting the signature, which means that if there are some stuff that are private, we're not supposed to observe them. And so let's look right now at an example. So I will use an OCaml syntax to, to write my, my examples. So let's consider a signature with two functions, an increment function of type unit or unit and a getter function of, a, of type unit or int. And then we've got those two implementations. So the first one, what does it do? Well, it's going to uh, first allocate a reference, and then they will have the two functions that implement the signature. The increment function is indeed going to increment the counter, and the getter function is going to return the value. And then there is a second implementation, and in the second implementation, what we do in fact, the increment function is not going to increment it. It's going to decrement it, but that's okay because at the end, the getter function will return not the value of the counter, but the opposite value. And so we are fine, and those two implementations of the signature are indeed contextually equivalent, but this is because C1 and C2 are private because they do not appear in the signature. So we cannot observe them directly. And so, yeah, this is the idea of contextual equivalence, which means that we can have interesting equivalence between programs because we cannot observe everything. And so I would claim here that contextual equivalence is the right modular notion of equivalence of programs. And by modular, here it means that you can reason an open program. So it means that you can really decompose like a huge program into small pieces and then reason on each pieces individually. And for example, you can also reason on each module and check that uh, there's an uh, in, uh, equivalent. And so contextual equivalence has been like studied like for decades now, and it's really the golden standard in the semantics of prime languages. There is like all this work around full abstraction, building full abstraction models, which means that we try to build a denotational model where equality in the denotation corresponds exactly to contextual equivalence. And it's really a hard problem, but really an important problem. So in this talk, I will consider a language which is called WebML, which is a fragment of ML, of OCaml, for example, which is a call by value simply type lambda calculus with unbounded integers and high order references. So a reference is a memory cell that we can allocate and uh, where we can store like either integers, other references, other locations, but also we can store function into it. This is what the high order here means. And so let's look at another example of non-equivalence this time. So we still try to, um, to implement a signature with an increment function and a getter, but the increment now is going to be a bit different because it will, is going to take as an argument a function, and it will first call the function, and then after, it will increment the counter. This is the first version of the signature. And the second one, what we're going to do? Well, we're going indeed also to increment the counter. This time, it's not like the first example where we decremented it. Here, we're going to increment it. But what we do is that we're going to increment it with a value stored in the counter before performing the callback. And here, we could imagine that the two versions could be equivalent because, well, come on. In both cases, we increment the counter, so it should be the case. But in practice, it's not because of reentrancy, which means that here, when we perform the callback to f, so we call f, then f could possibly call itself the increment function. And if it does that, then after that, 
if we use the getter function, we'll see a distinction between the two because on one side here we'll have increment two times the counter, but here only one time. So I've put this example really to show you that yeah, context recurrence is quite subtle because it means that we need to reason on we on C, we on call, for example, and even if we're like in a completely sequential setting, we still have to deal with this kind of problems. So it means that yeah, it's 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 complex problem. And indeed, there have been like 30 years of work that like, has a huge literature on how to prove this kind of example. So I'm not going to talk about all, uh, all of this work. There have been some that are going to be really, that, that have been really influential to me. So I will mention them later. But besides the, all those proof techniques, there is two works that are on game semantics that I think are important to mention. There is first some works that try to uh, design some desirable fragment of the language. So okay, the language clearly context recurrence is going to be undecidable because, for example, we can decide the other, I mean, we can uh, look at recurrence with a non-terminating program. So clearly, if we could decide it, it would mean that we can decide the resulting problem. But still, there are some small fragments where we can decide, indeed, context recurrence. But those fragments are, are really restricted. I mean, the, the type of the program has to be really simple. We cannot have recursion or uh, infinite data types, so they are quite restricted. And we cannot perform any kind of symbolic reasoning in, uh, in these techniques. And then, as I said, the problem is undecidable. This is expected, but what, at least for me, was less expected is that it's undecidable even if we work in a completely finite array setting. So if we have only finite data types and no recursion, the problem is already undecidable. And it's really because of the use of preferences and the fact that in the definition of context recurrence, we can't favor any kind of environment, any kind of program that can observe the distinction. And it's really because of this universal quantification that the program is, uh, is undecidable. OK, it's undecidable, but still, can we propose some sound tools to check automatically context equivalence? And this is what we're going to, to see. But first, I want to come back to a few proof techniques that has been really influential to me, because that will explain a bit what are the ideas we're going to see later. So the first one was a paper by uh, Pitts and Stark. And I think it's the first paper that introduced the idea of using logical relations to reason operationally on contextual equivalence. And this paper is really influential. It's, for me, a really beautiful paper. And what is also nice in this paper is that they present examples that they cannot deal with. And one, which is quite embarrassing, it's the so-called awkward example. So it's a really simple example. What happens is that uh, we've got those two programs. The first one, we allocate a reference. We put it to 0. And then we return a function that put x to 1 perform a callback, and returns value of x. And in the second version, what happened is that we just perform a callback and return directly 1. So they are equivalent because here in x, we are sure that x point to 1. But in practice, the, the, the techniques that they have introduced cannot deal with this kind of example, even if, if it was complete, which was a, still a bit mystery to me. And then there are another really landmark paper for me which was this paper uh, published at ICFE 2010 by uh, Dreyer, Nice, and Birkedal, where they uh, improve the logical relation introduced by Pitts and Stark. I mean, there had been also a lot of work in between. But this paper, for me, was, well, I've really, really liked it to read it. I really uh, advise you if, you, if you want to know more about logical relations, this paper is great. And what happened in this paper is that they proposed to introduce some kind of transition system of invariance to reason on contextual equivalence of program. And so here, for example, let's look at an, uh, a variant of the awkward example, uh, an improved one, where what happens is that this time we perform two callbacks. We first put x to 0, then x to 1, and in between we perform two callbacks. And at the end, we look at the value stored in x. And here, we, we perform the two callbacks, and we turn 1 directly. So the idea is that we want to prove that here, in x, x uh, points to 1. And so why is this true? Well, it's true, but for really uh, smart reason. It's true because we don't, the context does not have access to any kind of control operators, like call CC, uh, for example. And because what happens is that here, when we perform a callback, this is the second callback, we could perform a re-entrant call and call again the wall function. And in this case, even if x has been put to 1, it could be put to 0 again. But it's not a problem because we don't have control operators. So if we don't have control operators, it means that the execution of this front end call must terminate so that we can go back to the first call. And if it terminates, x is going to be, uh, to, to, is going to be set to 1 again, and so we are fine. And the idea to, uh, to, to prove this kind of 
of example, is using this kind of transition system of invariance and using different kind of transition to indicate if the context can, can take the transition or if it's uh, the program. I, I won't give all the details. We'll see a bit later another kind of transition system that so that those one are an abstraction of the transition system I'm going to introduce. Okay. So if we look at the proof in this uh, ICF 2010 paper in the appendix, we look at, I mean, the proof at the end, it's still quite complex. It's like two pages. I mean, it's quite technical. But when we dig into it, what happens is that most of it is really some kind of boilerplate boiler reasoning. I mean, it's really um, just kind of reasoning of due to high order stuff like callbacks and we could try to synchronize them and we'd have to deal with continuation and everything. And, but at the end, most of it could be, I mean, is not that interesting. The interesting part is the transition systems that I've shown you. Here we have to be smart to design it. And so the question I, I had was, is it possible to automate this kind of proofs? And by automate, I mean not only the boilerplate one, but also the generation of the transition system. And so what I'm going to present you, the framework I've designed, is yes, we can do that. So the framework is called CiteAC because it uses symbolic, temporal, and circular reasoning. And it's really a, generated, a general automated tool to check contextual equivalence of FML programs. And so, okay, this slide is maybe the most important slide of the talk. It's what, we've, what I've done in this, uh, in this uh, framework is to reduce the problem of contextual equivalence to a non-reachability problem of some kind of failed state, is what we, we call them, in the transition system of memory configuration. And this transition system is interesting because there's no high order value anymore. Like we only handle uh, integers and location into it and no more lambda abstraction or anything. So it's really high uh, first order. We use non-determinism to represent all the possible behavior of all contexts and it's automatically generated. And the idea is that the path to the failed states really correspond to possible contexts that can discriminate the, the, the two programs. And after that, in some cases, not all of them, but in some cases, you can reduce the non reachability of failed states into some kind of uh, satisfiability of some constraint on clauses. And this has been implemented. You can go check this uh, GitHub page to, to, to find the tool and test it if you want. So here, an example, so I, I won't spend a lot of time on, on it, just to, to give you an example of the kind of transition system we, uh, we, uh, we're dealing with. So this was the version, the first example I've gi given you of the counter with the increment and the getter function. I've just re rewritten it so that it's more apparent what is public and what is private. So here we return the increment and the getter as a pair, but C1 is still private. And so here what happens is that it's really an alternation between what the program do and what the context do. And in fact, behind the stage, there is game semantics. This is why you will see some kind of operation or OQ, which means uh, opponent question and PA, PA answers kind of stuff. But basically, what we really represent with this transition system is all the possible interaction of these two programs synchronized with respect to any context. And really, I insist on any context. So I won't present the way we are going to read this, but what I want to say is that this transition system the idea is that it represents the evolution of some kind of configuration. In the configuration, there is the two heaps where the references are stored, but there is also a stack to deal with well bucketing because we don't have control operators, so we need to be careful about the, the, way, the way it's going to work. And that's also a, a, an environment to remember the first order values. So, as I said, using this, oh, and sorry, this state is a failed state, so the idea is that we want to check that is there a run that starts in zero and goes to six. If it's the case, they are not contextual equivalent, but if there's no such run, it means that they are contextual equivalent. And so as I said, we reduce contextual equivalence to non reachability of failed state, and this is always possible for recursion-free programs. From without recursion, we, we know always how to do that, so it means that we are complete. And I think this is really important because it really means that Without recursion, there is, these techniques always work. I mean, the reduction. We'll see that, the, uh, according to uh, uh, horn clauses, does not always work. But at least the reduction to non reachability always works. We are really complete with respect to that. For recursion programs, it's a bit more complex. Of course, I mean, recursion is really hard to reason on. So we do, we do some kind of circular and equational reasoning. There's a lot of examples we cannot deal with, but at least examples like impure factorial or higher order iterators, we know how to deal with them. So it's already quite nice, I think. 
And how does it work? We use some kind of symbolic evaluation to get the interaction points of each program with the context. And also the constraint on the way the heap was the references are stored evolves. And then we synchronize those interaction points. If we cannot, we generate failed state. And another point is that we use free variables to represent high order values that are provided by context. So to sum up, this is the way the tool works. So P1, P2 are the two programs. We feed into a, a kind of symbolic evaluation that also performs synchronization at the same time. And this is what I've called uh, symbolic creepy open relation. It can fail when there is recursion, but without recursion, it cannot fail. It will always generate this S here, which is uh, this uh, symbolic creep key open relation. And from it, we generate the transition system of memory configuration. After that, we can perform some reachability analysis on, on it to check if failed state are reachable by encoding the problem to uh, constraint on closes. And so checking on reachability, as I said, we don't know how to do that always. The point is that when there is interactions that can generate unbounded heap, then I don't know how to encode this problem into uh, constraint on closes. In a way, it's like reasoning, you know, on programs, I don't know, with loop or recursion, where you allocate inside the video function. So in this case, you can always have, uh, I mean, you cannot bound the size of the heap, and it's, so far, it's really hard. So, so far, I don't know how to deal with this example. I mean, I know how to reduce it to the transition system, but the last part, I don't know how to do that. So, what's next? So, I would like to remove some restrictions there is on this work. I haven't told about all of them. I've told you about the reference creation inside functions that, so far, I don't know how to deal with because I need bounded heap. There's also uh, other one with uh, higher order references. I don't know well to deal with higher order references in programs. What is important is that context here, I always suppose that context have access to higher order references, but for programs, there is an asymmetry because with higher order references, you can do like crazy recursion stuff. For example, there is a famous landing knot. You can encode the recursion with higher order references, but you can do also different kind of recursions that are really, really hard to handle. So, so far, I don't know well how to do, do that. And I don't deal with uh, reference exchange and disclosure so far. So this, I've got some ideas to deal with it, but to automate it, it's a bit hard because I'm, uh, I'm using uh, some kind of nominal reasoning to do that, and I don't know well how to, uh, to, to merge, like automated nominal reasoning with uh, constraint hand clauses. So here, there's still uh, work, uh, work to do to, to do that. And I would like to, do, to deal with bigger programs. So far, I've only tested like, the example of the literature, which are quite small. And to deal with bigger programs, I would need to, I would rely on the compositionality of the framework, framework, which is really important. Since we are compositional, we can divide really the big program into small pieces. But even for some small pieces that I cannot divide more, especially with recursion, there is some limitation so far with the constraint hand closer, uh, constraint hand closes solvers that I'm using, which make it, it doesn't work that well. So maybe I would have to design my own tool to do that. It's not clear yet. Let's see. And I would like to deal with new language feature, like control operators. And in fact, control operators really simplify the framework, because in this case, context have more power, so can discriminate more terms. And in a way, it's simpler. So this is why, in fact, I've really chosen the hard way by uh, not picking control operators, so that there is more equivalence and more interesting equivalence. With control operators, a lot of equivalence do, does not hold, uh, do not hold anymore, so it's not that interesting. I would like to de deal with parametric polymorphism and especially aspect data types. And this is like, for me, the main point, the main interesting part that I'm working on right now, using some kind, again, of nominal techniques. And I think this part is really, uh, really interesting. Maybe concurrency, let's see. And last point, I would like to go beyond relational reasoning and really do some kind of composi compositional static analysis for OCaml, like really for higher order language with references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Guillaume. Um, so uh, let me start with a, a question on Slido. So um, are there, is there any practical use of this, for example, in the OCaml compiler? No, uh, not yet. I mean, we, we, we're not yet there. We, uh, we're just dealing with small examples. But later, yeah, ideally, it's true that if you could like, uh, check automatically a program transformation with this tool, like check that the transformation of program indeed uh, preserve contextual equivalence, this would be really nice. But we are not there yet. I think there's still a lot of work to do before reaching this point. 
Yeah, so uh, thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, first of all, thank you for engaging so deeply with our uh, ICFP 10 paper. Um, that's, a, that's an honor. Uh, something that wasn't clear to me, are you actually um, inferring the transition systems for these examples, or do you have to put in, a, do, you have to, the, uh, do you have to explicitly state a transition system oh, no, no, I, and then have the, pro, uh, the proof inferred? I'm, infer I'm inferring them. This, this one I really uh, inferred automatically. Okay, so then for the examples in the ICP 10 paper, how many of those can you infer the proofs for all the one, for all of them or all of them with some restriction? Uh, or which? There are some that I cannot handle, the one with uh, different di divergence. Yeah, right. Because I, I could handle them, but it will complexify so much. Uh, yeah. And I don't think they are really representative of what is interesting. No. Different yeah. So I don't handle them. And uh, the one with uh, polymorphism, uh, abstract data types, not yet, but hopefully soon. And I think most... The other one, yeah, most of them I can handle them. The callback with lock, I can. Uh, and the well bracket state change. Yeah, 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 that's one no problem. And yeah. I can also deal with uh, programs with recursion, like factorial, uh, impure factorial versus pure factorial. This I can deal with them also. Very cool. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So there is another question on Slido um, uh, by Kielt. Uh, how much of CITC could be integrated in an interactive proof assistant? That's <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, so in fact, I, I'm thinking about that especially for the um, reasoning on recursion, uh, problem with recursion. In this case, well, clearly, I mean, we can have automated tool, but it will be interesting, like, the, to have some uh, feedback from the user to say, okay, at this point, we can synchronize rec recursive calls. And in this case, yeah, I would like to integrate it to with an interactive uh, serum prover, but. It really relies on uh, game semantics behind the stage and formalizing game semantics in an uh, interactive term prover so far has not been done yet. So it's a tough question. And uh, I would like to do that, but I don't have yet the tools. Maybe soon. I've got some ideas using interaction trees, maybe. Let's see. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. Uh, so, so one other question that I, I was wondering about. So the Dreyer and Eisberg paper Yes. So it uses these public-private transitions. So, what exactly is the non-reachability uh, problem in terms of these transitions? Can you say that? Uh, so, what happens is that the transition system I'm building is like really a bit low level, and the kind of transition system there is in the ICFP the paper, it's an abstraction in a way of this transition system. Here, I'm using a stack to deal with uh, well bucketing. But after that, we can rebuild on top of that, and in fact, is what I'm doing to prove soundness and completeness of those public transition that correspond to a completely well-bracketed interaction. Okay, um, so I don't see any other questions, so let's thank Guillaume again. And, uh